Whoa. I used to like Nima, but um, two things. He dresses better than me, and he can rap. Okay, so I'm just going to do some housekeeping. In honour of APRA and the Chiropractic Board of Australia, uh, the codes and regulations, we advise that all DCs present here at DG Congress throughout the weekend are registered chiropractors or doctors within their country of residence only. Throughout the weekend, you may be photographed or videoed by the DG Congress staff. Um, if you have any concerns with this, please tell us. And we want you to be sort of just, just you know, comfortable. We don't want any of these sort of red carpet ones. You know, with, um, just be natural. There are two doors for entering uh, and leaving main plenary, um, and they will be shut on the commencement of the um, scheduled uh, presentations. Um, if you are late, then um, please enter quietly, please. Uh, wear your name tags at all times. There will be staff that will be checking your name tags. Um, please honour the speakers by turning off your phones or putting them silent. Any phone call um, that happens during a presentation, that's a $100 fine which will go to spinal research. Um, the music you heard on the way is the cue music, so the Pharrell Williams um, happy. So, so that's, the, that's the, the music that you're going to hear to call you into plenary and the sessions. Um, throughout my 15, 16 years um, of being chiropractor, um, this next speaker has given me so many hows I don't know what to do with. You know, you know, every time that he graces the stage at any, you know, any sort of um, presentation, he is full of hows, how to be a better person, how to be a great chiropractor, how to just love and serve better. He is the custodian of DG, Dr. John Hinwood. He's a co-founder of Dynamic Growth. Together with his wife, Judy, they now spend their life taking the chiropractic message of proactive health, uh, care to individuals, families, and the corporate world, delivering innovative and transformational work in stress life balance and mindset change. Their work is engaging and thought provoking. They also have a great reputation with global leaders in stress management. Put your hands together for Dr. John Himwood. Thank you. I'm going to share with you three stories this afternoon. And those three stories are, are about how. How these three people changed the lives of millions of people. This first person is Robert Desnos. Robert Desnos was a surrealist poet in the 1930s. He was Jewish. And he was rounded up in Paris and taken to Auschwitz. Anybody here been to Auschwitz? Scary place. Would you agree? Those are at the, the luncheon, the speaker's luncheon, the team, team luncheon. Phil McMaster shared about vibration. When you arrive at Auschwitz, there's vibrations there that are unbelievably negative. Because when the Germans left Auschwitz in 1945, they didn't realise the Russians were coming, and they had to bolt, and they couldn't destroy the things that they'd created there. They're still there, and they've been preserved in a museum. Last month, you may have seen, it was the anniversary of 70 years for survivors of Auschwitz. And there was quite a bit on television about it. Desnos, in his group, here he is in middle, front and centre there with the beard. They were on a road game. They'd been worked for a number of years till it got to this. Here they are, skin and bone. The camp decided that they were no longer useful. Robert Desnos and his group walked out of the barracks this morning, and instead of the truck facing that way, the truck was facing that way. They weren't going to work, they were going to the gas chamber. Skin and bone. The how. How can you change this and not go to the gas chamber today? Robert Desnos was first onto the back of the truck. He got on and he ran backwards. He got down the end. First man, show me your hand. Show me your hand. I was a famous palm reader before coming here. Show me your hand and I'll tell you about your future when this camp is liberated. 
He said, what I see in your hand here, he said, you're going to be a leader in Europe. You're going to help with the unification of Europe at the end of the war. The next man, show him your hand. You're going to America to be a famous banker. And all of a sudden, these men, skin and bone, leapt out of the truck. Read my hand, read my hand, read my hand. And Desnos told them stories of what they would be and how they would do it after the war. Two weeks later, Auschwitz was liberated. The SS guards didn't know this, but they were bamboozled. They were totally put, they didn't know what to do. So they truck, they put them all back onto the truck. Sorry, they took them off the truck and put them back in the barracks. And the next day, they took them all back to work. They'd never seen raw energy like that. Why would we put these people in the gas chamber when we can use that energy? Two weeks later, it was liberated. The next year, Desnos died of typhus. But the palm readings he gave to those men did become leaders in America, did become leaders in Europe, did become famous bankers, economists. They fulfilled the role. Desnos told them where they were going at that extreme state where they were headed to the gas chamber, they took on a new persona. Wow. All of us here inspire our tribes. We've got tribe family. We've got tribe students. We've got tribe in our practice of the patients who come to see us. We're all leaders of tribes here, and we can inspire them, simply. Judge. I won't mention his name. He's a judge in the Queensland Supreme Court. In 1983, the last mainland state, Queensland, brought in chiropractic legislation. As soon as that happened, chiropractors were given the privilege of working under the Workers' Compensation Act. We received a letter, and that letter said, you are now classified as a physiotherapist. Do you think I was happy? Not very happy. I've been the chairman of, I was vice president of the Chiropractic Association in Queensland. I've been chairman of the Workers' Compensation Committee, working with the Workers' Compensation Board prior to that. And I phoned the general manager, Jim Campbell, who was a very arrogant man. And I said, how do we change that, Jim? Bloody sue me. I said, well, what do we need to do? He said, change the act. I thought, costly business to employ a solicitor. So I said to him, how about I write to you and ask, would you have Crown Law write back to me and give me every section of the act that needs to be changed so we could be called chiropractors? He said, oh, I'd love to do it. I said, thank you, which he did. Probably saved thirty or $40,000 the government paid for. Then engaged the barrister, took him to court. What happened? Took three months, judgment was reserved, we gained the qualification of the Workers' Compensation Board recognition as chiropractors. And the judge said, this is quite amazing. He said, there's actually no classification for physiotherapists. Under the Act, they're covered under wax bars, massage bars, and Turkish baths. But somewhere along the way, someone changed it. They shouldn't have. It's never been done by law. So I enacted that into the law as well. I didn't see any more of that till three months later. It's a Tuesday afternoon. I'm not working. I'm walking down Queen Street in Brisbane past the Supreme Court. And who should come out but the judge? I stopped, I went over and I said, Your Honour, John Hinwood, thank you for creating the category of chiropractors. He said, look, do you mind if we chat a moment? I said, I'd love to, but he didn't let my hand go. And then he put his other hand on top. And he said, let me share with you a story. He said, I was the oldest of nine children. My mother had nine children in ten years. She was active, huh? <laughs> Good vibrations. He said when she had the ninth child, they wouldn't let her out of hospital because she had cancer and she'd be dead in three weeks. He said my father took him out of hospital and all these people said, you need to go and see Mr. Shelby. Now Ernst Shelby was a chiropractor from Sweden who'd been practicing in Sydney from about 1908 and the outbreak of World War I 
because he had a name of Ernst Shelbe, people started to attack him physically because they thought he was a German. So he moved to a place called Miller Miller. Now Miller Miller is up in the Atherton Tablelands in the middle of nowhere. And Ernst Shelbe went to Miller Miller and practiced. This is what Ernst Shelbe's practice in Miller Miller looked like. Beachview. Look at the tent camp here. He had hundreds of people turning up and he had to train a staff of people in the Shelby technique to work with those people. He said, I remember walking in there with my dad, all the kids, I was carrying the baby and he carried mother. My mother was 29. And Mr. Shelby said, I believe that your wife's body can heal and the work we do here can help her. But you'll need to leave her here. She'll need to live in because we'll need to attend to her several times a day in order for her body to respond and heal. Then the judge starts to cry. There are people going by, seeing the judge holding me, and I'm holding his, and he starts to cry. His vibrations were so going, I'm crying. We're both standing there bawling. And he's telling me the story of what happened. How his mother did recover in a matter of a few months. And how she only passed away last year at 89. She had, chiropractic gave her 60 more years of life. She got to bring up her children, got to meet her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, and also some great-great-grandchildren. He said, chiropractic needs to be recognised. Thank you. So we hugged there, I don't know, for a bit of time. He went on his way and I went on my way. Look what Shelby did. Camps full of people, up in the back of nowhere in Queensland. He inspired who? His tribe, tribe chiropractic, and then the community at large. The last story. That's me on my third birthday. <laughs> now, on my, at this time, I became quite curious. I had a grandfather, my mother's father, who was a commercial artist. And beside his workbench was this picture. Pretty spunky looking dude of the times. Right? I used to ask him, who is that? He said, that's your great uncle, George Frederick Cook. And he and his brother, Albert, went to the First World War and were killed. And he, it's always stayed in my mind. We've been to, he found his grave at Brewery Orchard, up near the French-Belgian border a few years ago. Now, here he is. He arrives at Gallipoli. He survives Gallipoli with his brother. They then go to the Dardanelles. They survive the Dardanelles. From there, they go to Egypt. Survived again. And now I moved on to the Western Front. When he went and en enlisted, why did men enlist in those days? Because said the war would be ended in six months. Have a holiday in Europe. Help God, king and country. Off he went. And if you live in certain rural communities in Australia, you'll often find a half or a third of the young men in that community, or even fathers, were lost. We lived in a place called Upper Coomera for a while, and three quarters of the males in Upper Coomera died in the First World War. Then the Anzacs arrive in 1916 in France to join the British Army on the Western Front to defeat Germany. I have a collection of all the letters George and Albert wrote and sent back home to their brother Ernest. And the last letter is about how big his how was. He was a stretcher bearer. He wasn't, he was an infantry man. And they ran out of stretcher bearers. And his last letter to his brother said, Dear Ern, please don't give this letter to mother to read, it may worry her. 
He said, today, I volunteered to be a stretcher bearer because we need to go out there and bring our mates back who are injured, who are wounded. But please don't tell mother because this is going to be my hardest assignment because the average lifespan of a stretcher bearer here is 12 hours. He said, I'm doing this for God, king and country. I have to earn. May I ask, you think about what would you do for chiropractic if you were at that point in time? Would it mean that much you'd sacrifice your life and move forward? He finished his letter. It was collected from him as he sat in the trench before he was to go that evening. And a large piece of shrapnel came through the roof and killed him stone dead. The men either side of him, not harmed. But he was prepared to take the ultimate sacrifice for what he believed in. And how did he do it? He became a leader in his tribe. He inspired his tribe. Imagine how the men in the trench that night went out and fought. They lost their mate. He was going to go out there and bring people back. The wounded. So as we go through this weekend, if you can think, how are you going to become a leader in your tribe? How are you going to inspire your tribe? The tribe chiropractic that you're a member of. I challenge you to go away from here being a better person and knowing the how you're going to inspire your tribe. Thank you. So say Thank you, John, for those amazing and inspirational stories. Our next speaker, when I looked at her notes to introduce her, I was kind of a bit sad because I'm, I'm a way underachiever. Um, Kim Morrison is a mother, world record holder, five times best-selling author, and founder of 28 Chemical Free Skin Care. She was the youngest ever female to run 100 miles in less than 24 hours, and she is dedicated to sharing her lessons of achieving the impossible overcoming self-imposing limitations and shining in, in the darkest hours. She's also on the wellness couch and has one of the most high-rating podcasts um, in the world. So put your hands together for Kim Morrison. It was the 8th of June, 1988. I was sitting in a portaloo on the side of a 400 metre track. My toenails were lifting. I had blisters all over the soles of my feet. I had chafing everywhere, even my nipples were bleeding. And I wondered, how the hell did I get there? Life is a series of choices, decisions, and paths that we take. I had a dream at 15, I wanted to play netball for New Zealand. And I realized at 16 years of age that I was too short and was probably not going to make it. But there was a series of choices that I had that led me to Melbourne, Australia, where I had the most amazing feeling, and I'm sure many of you will appreciate this, that you know you're in the right time at the right place. And there was a gymnasium right there where I was training, and right next to that gymnasium was a natural therapies college. And there was a course for $160 and I had $180 in my bank account, and I enrolled. That 10 weeks became three and a half years of learning, and the more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know. During part of my training and my studies, I had to find a way to um, log up my hours, my community hours, and some of you may be very familiar with the name Cliff Young. And Cliff Young, for those of you that don't know, won the inaugural Sydney to Melbourne race where he ran 1,015 kilometres and beat the rest of the field at 68 years of age. I was assigned to Cliffy, and that man still to this day is one of my greatest mentors. I don't know whether I was chosen because I was blonde or whether it was just luck of the draw, but he told me he liked the blondes working on him. And whilst I was massaging him one day during this 24-hour event, 
I looked at him and he said, how's it going, kid? And I said, this is the most boring thing I've ever done in my entire life, watching 40 athletes run around a 400-meter track. It's bizarre. And he said to me, why don't you give it a crack? And I thought at 19 years of age, considering all of these people were kind of like old farts, that I would actually be able to beat them given my age. So three months later, I took Cliffy up, and there I was lined up on a platform where I, I don't know if I can, oh, there we go. There I am in the green shorts at the front, very excited to think that I was the youngest in the field, ready to run 12 hours. Now, I had never run beyond 10 Ks in my life. <laughs> so as I lined up there, Cliffy came up to me and he said, I've got one piece of advice for you. And I said, what's that, Cliffy? And he said, it's 90% mental and 10% physical. Got it? And I went, yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Four hours into that race, I ran through the marathon. And it was at that point where everyone was clapping and said, oh, you've done well, that I thought my race was over. I'd had enough. Everything hurt. And I went into the pit stop tent and I told everybody that I quit. I became incredibly emotional and vulnerable and I did a mini tantrum. And as I sat there, I was looking at everybody and I was thinking, this is the cruelest, most stupidest thing. And I had this voice inside of me saying, what the hell are you doing? Cliffy came into the pit stop tent and he tapped his head and he pushed on his heart and he looked at me and he said, really? This is 90% mental and 10% physical? I said, my ankle hurts. He said, well, instead of sitting here in the pit stop tent, which you've now renamed the pity party tent, I suggest that you get up and put one foot in front of the other and do not stop moving forward. I was lucky to, to actually keep going through that race and towards the end, I don't know how I did it, I fought those demons like you wouldn't believe. But with one hour to go on that race, I had no, uh, no idea how far I'd come or what I'd done. I just had a support team that just kept cheering every lap. And as they put the sandbag down when the 12th hour went off, they measured that last lap and I cripply walked into the um, beautiful presentation room and I sat there and realized I actually couldn't get back up. <laughs> Everything had seized. And whilst I was sitting there, they named the third place getter, the second place getter. And then they called my name and said, Kim, you have run 95.4 kilometers. And as I stood up very begrudgingly to get my trophy, Cliffy just tapped his head pointed to his heart and just had a beaming smile of pride. And as they gave me my, my trophy, they said, you've done so well. By winning this race, you've, rep you've won a place to represent Victoria in the 24-hour championships in three months' time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in that moment as everyone was clapping, I thought, are you serious? I have to do that all over again and twice as long. So anyway, I trained a bit harder and Cliffy came up to me. We were up in the Danny Nongs one day doing a training run. And as we went around the corner, I cut the corner and he went, hmm, interesting. People who cut corners in training cut corners in life. I have never, ever cut a corner on a training run again. He said to me at the beginning of the next race, all I ask that you do is when you get to this race, you make sure that you have your mind and 90% mental and 10% physical. And it was six hours into the race, I met the demon, my own self, who sat there saying to me, what the hell are you doing? This is stupid, everything's hurting. Why don't you quit? And I went into the pity party tent and Cliffy came in and he said, you're in the pity party room again. And I said, yes. And he said, well, why don't you find some distractions and just keep putting one foot in front of the other. That is actually a Walkman and it is a cassette tape. And the only cassette that I had was Talking Heads, and the album was Stop Making Sense. And the first track on that album, for those of you that know, is I'm on the road to nowhere. <laughs> the most exciting thing about a 24-hour race is that every six hours, the athletes change direction. <laughs> so here I was, I'd got to the 12-hour mark, somewhere I'd been before, but now I was heading into unknown territory. And as I sat there listening to my demons constantly surface themselves, I had a girlfriend turn up who had all these oils. And she started doing compresses on my head. And she said to me, you've got to believe in the power within you. And it was my first introduction to essential oils. And as she was putting those oils across me, she said, this is the innate intelligence from the plants speaking to you. Find that innate intelligence within you and just put one foot in front of the other. I listened to her and I took her advice and I was out on the track again, feeling great. 
But then the midnight shift hurt. And as it approached and as it hurts for most of us, it's called the graveyard shift for a very special reason. Most people are fast asleep. Uh, most people are finding it really hard to walk and be out there on the track. And Judith kept giving me these compresses and said, come on, one foot in front of the other, tap into that power within. Cliffy kept doing this, and then he came up to me and he said, I've got one piece of advice for you. The race is not always to the swift, but to those that keep on running. Don't give up. But two hours later, that voice appeared again, and she said, this is ridiculous, no one does this. This is so bad that my left knee was hurting so much I quit the race. But this time I decided not to tell anybody because they kept trying to encourage me to get back out on the track. So I took myself into that portaloo toilet with everything hurting. And unbeknown to me, I fell asleep. I got woken, though, by a very, very hot fireman who had the jaws of life and cracked it open, and they all yelled out, she's alive, she's alive. And I realised then the trauma I had put my team through, that I, they thought I had collapsed and actually not done very well at all. And Cliffy went past in the background, he looked in, he tapped his head, and he just shook his head, and I felt so bad, so guilty. Judith was standing there with compresses and oils ready to give it to me, and I just looked at them all, and I just went, I don't know if I can do it. Then I hopped out of there, out of the portal, they pulled up my pants, and as I hopped out, they asked me to stand on the scales, and then the doctor said, I'm sorry, Kim, you've lost seven kilos. I say, Jenny Craig, eat your heart out. Um, <laughs> you've lost seven kilos, that's too much. You, uh, I'm now officially pulling you out of the race. Now, I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but the minute someone told me I couldn't do it, I found some voice inside of me that said, how dare you? So I found these oils and Judith came up to me. She said, oh, honey, I'm going to give you the biggest armour of all, and that is rose oil. Now, you might be interested to know that a healthy human body resonates at 65 megahertz per second. Rose oil is the highest of all known substances on the planet that resonates with a vibrational frequency of 320 megahertz. When she told me that, I don't know whether it was the rose oil, I don't know whether it was just the attitude, but I picked up my game. When Cliffy kept saying to me, you've got to remember, this is, all, this is like life. This marathon is like life. It's one foot in front of the other. You're going to have chafing. You're going to have moments. And I used to walk around that track with him and on our training runs, and he would constantly say, look at running as a metaphor for life. As the sun came up out of the graveyard shift, that was the Victorian champion, Sandra Kerr. Now, I had no idea where I was up to or where I had, how far I'd come. But when Melissa and my team said to me that you could be in front of her, I ended up running the last two hours of that race quicker than the first two hours. I did not want to run for 22 hours to be told I had lost. So in the, as again they put the sandbag down and before I knew it they called out that Sandra Kerr had got second place and then I had won and I had set a world record for being the youngest female to run 100 miles in less than 24 hours. I ran 102 miles, 168.5 kilometres, and still to this day I stand here and wonder how the hell did I do that? As I was standing there with her, Cliffy came up to me and he said to me, I'm so proud of you, as he was handing me the trophy. And as he handed me the trophy, he said, and guess what? You have just won a place to represent Australia <laughs> at the World Indoor 24 Hour Championships. My dream of playing netball for New Zealand became running for this amazing country and I ended up getting to England. One of our training runs that we did in the Dandenongs, and that was, well, that was down at Wilson's Promontory, actually. And all I keep thinking of, every time I'm out there in nature, I am just so grateful for her magnificence, her beauty, her power. And often in life, we get so drawn into the mundane, the drama, and we all know when we walk barefoot on a beach or when we're walking on mud or when we're actually feeling the rain on our face, how powerful and potent that innate power of nature is. And so I carried on. In using the oils, I decided to start studying them more and wanted to know more and more about it. And I realised that whilst knowledge is incredible, there's sometimes there's things that are just so beyond what we are capable of ever understanding. I looked back to the history of it and I started studying how far this has come. Now, surely with culture and tradition, our forefathers and foremothers must have known something. 
And I think to in today's society, it's so scary that we think as human beings that we have this ability to know better than what we should all know, which is that innate, powerful intelligence. When I stand there in the power of beautiful lavender fields or when I see the extraction of rose oil and I sit there listening to the magic if there's such a thing, if you can understand the power of smell, when we inhale something, it hits the olfactory part of the brain, travels up into the limbic part, hits the central nervous system within four seconds, we can have a reaction. How powerful to anchor it in when we realize most decisions are made emotionally. How powerful then that smell is the closest um, sense that's linked to our emotions, why not create anchors and rituals that combine with the power of what we're able to do as human beings? I know as a leader, as I stand here in front of everybody, I realize the, the rituals and the jobs and the, and the things I do as a mum and as a businesswoman actually impacts others. But here I am standing here and I'm so humbled. I think I'm here by accident. I don't know how I get to stand in front of all you incredible people because it humbles me to think that you would want to hear my story when I look out to all of you and realize the power of the knowledge. You guys stand alone. You think differently. You have the power to change the way our future generation is going to grow up, understanding health and well-being in their bodies like no other. And I invite you to stand as a world record champion, even though you may not have run a 24-hour race, but I invite you to stand in the power of what that means. What have I learned from Cliffy? Well, I have certainly learned that it's not about what, I have, what happens to me, but it's certainly about the way I react to it. And from that, I feel incredibly proud to say that it's not my how. I know I appreciate your topic is how. How did I do it? I, I tried to come up with a way to tell you how I set a world record. I really don't know. Was it the oils? Was it the broths that they fed me in the middle of the night to get me through that graveyard shift? Was it the fact that I had massage therapists and people there looking after me? Was it Cliffy tapping his head? Was it just the vibrational energy of everybody out there on the park crying and feeling how hard it was to take one step after the other? Or was it just an innate intelligence that had me want to be better than anybody else? I'm proud to say that I ended up running in England for Australia and I took the power of those oils with me and I snorted them like you wouldn't believe <laughs> and I ended up setting eight Australian indoor records. So why do I do what I do? For many of you, I'm sure it's the same. These guys. My husband, for those of you that don't know, played cricket for Australia. He actually, I mean, for New Zealand, he actually held a world record as well. <laughs> don't worry, my son wants to be an all black or an Australian cricketer because they're both winners. Um, <laughs> but I, Danny has taught me so much. I mean, he was the little guy with the big heart, the big smile, and I was so proud to watch him play. And as one of New Zealand's only hat trick makers, I realised also he was an auspicious world record holder. Uh, he held the world record for test ducks at one point, so we are very proud. <laughs> but my beautiful children, my daughter who was so channeled and excited about using her unbelievable sense of self to become an Australian ballerina, maybe even dance with a New York ballet, her goal is that. I invite each of you to look at your why. And for many of us, I know that in our treatment room, that's not the word for chiropractors. Treatment is not the right word. For your rooms where you create wellness for everybody. I just think every time I go in and see Mark Postles and his beautiful team, and I see the spritzes on the counter and the vaporizer going, I just think you have no idea of the magic and the creation, of the, the vibrational energy and the raising of that vibrational energy. Lavender has a vibrational megahertz reading of 118. And we know lavender is one of the most beautiful oils and the most common and safest oils to use in all time. So my why. These are the reason I get up each day. These guys are the ones, and I hope as someone who's made a stance, it took me 10 years to create my own organic, chemical-free range of oils because I truly believe if we can tap into nature, then we have the power to actually assist the body to do the work. They're just the tool. And if we can be the conduit as a therapist and we can be the conduit as a teacher, then hopefully with the power of anchoring in with rituals and tools like essential oils, then we can create change within four seconds. I stand here before you when I looked at my beautiful son one day and I am not here to say to you I've got it right or I always get it right. 
Just five years ago, I was in a heap on the floor in my bathroom. I couldn't breathe. My beautiful grandmother had passed away. My husband had fallen off the, uh, completely derailed. His sister had taken her life. We lost our house. Everything went from being this amazing celebrity fantasy bubble to our worlds crushing down. I couldn't do it anymore when we lost everything we'd earned in a financial institution breakdown. And I had to find 40 grand to actually print my book, Like Chocolate for Women. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can't do it. And I had a girlfriend, I said to her, maybe this is a sign from the universe, I, sh I shouldn't do it. And she looked at me and she said, my beautiful Cindy O'Meara, she said, maybe it's the universe saying, how bad do you want it? So I picked myself up and I begged everybody from $50 through to one lady wrote me a $20,000 check. And I'm proud to say I paid it off just a couple of years ago. But whilst I was on that floor in a heap, I couldn't see the light for the trees. I just couldn't breathe. My daughter comes in and she goes, mummy, mummy, smell rose. You've got to smell rose, it'll help you. She was 11. My, my husband's rubbing my back going, it'll be all right. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And my son's sitting there going, what's your problem? <laughs> And I said, just go away, and they all left me. And they went down to the beach. And whilst, I was in the be down at the, whilst they were down at the beach, I still hadn't moved from the fetal position. And they came back, and they held me again. And then I just said to them, oh, you've got to leave me alone. And my beautiful daughter and my husband left me, but my son laid on the edge of the bed, and he said, now listen here. You at 10, you have always told us, never, ever give up. And I thought, bugger. <laughs> And he said to me, now listen here, you know that inside each and every one of us, it's like a big diamond in the middle of a massive mountain. He goes, your problem right here, mum, is that you're trying to get to it with nail clippers. And I looked at him and he goes, if you pick yourself up and you carry on, then I promise you people are going to come with us and they're going to have hacks and um, diggers and spades and all sorts of things and we're going to hack into that mountain. Do you understand? And I nodded and then he looked at me and he goes, if you promise me, mum, never give up, I promise you the bulldozers, everything's going to come in and they're going to hand you that TNT dynamite stick and the mountain's going to erupt and there's the diamond that you know is in there and now your job, mum, is to make sure you shine your diamond so that everybody else can see theirs. He was 10. And I looked and I said, Jacob, where did you get that from? That's amazing. He said, well, actually, it's this really cool PlayStation game and I was wondering if I could get it. <laughs> <laughs> he still to this day has no idea how much that picked me up off the floor. So I want to finish with this. Every time I light my vaporizer, I look at that candle, that light, that flame, and I say this quote, if there is light in the soul, there is beauty in the person. If there is beauty in the person, there is harmony in the home. If there is harmony in the home, there is order in the nation. If there is order in the nation, there is peace in this world. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Next time I'm having one of those little pity parties or those sort of sad, sad sort of moments, that's the talk that I'm going to be listening to, to inspire me. Now, throughout this weekend, we're going to have the finalists um, from their regions of Talk the Tick present to us. Now, Talk the Tick, if you don't know, is a competition which has now become global. It focuses on giving chiropractic students the opportunity to develop their skills in presenting and explaining to the world about chiropractic. And we have the pleasure here to have the New Zealand Michael Clark. <laughs> now, I realize because of my name, some of you might have been expecting a cricket player, uh, but alas, it's only me. Uh, a Canadian now living in New Zealand, visiting Australia. Go, go figure. Uh, it is a great honor and a great pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I am very grateful. Welcome, in my most sincere way, to each and every one of you here. Bonjour, salut, mes amis. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. So let's start with a quick poll of the room. How many among you can play the piano? Raise your hand. Good, a few pianists. I had the fortune of learning to play the piano in my very young childhood and I've since been playing for the last three quarters of my life. And one thing throughout the year, many, many years, is that I loved, if there's a piano in the room, to go sit up and play. I'll play a chord, I'll play a scale, I'll play the opening lines of some music, content to listen and to feel and to enjoy. Now, more often than not, my anticipation of this joy is ruined by what could be called a jarring assault upon the senses. 
the piano is out of tune. There's only discord and war as the enharmonic overtones compete. The overtones are in a full-out war, and the result, jarring disdain illustrated in the body in a shiver and a cringe. No one likes to play an out of tune piano. The music that was once so enjoyable is now completely unrecognizable. Nobody likes to play an out of tune piano, and this is my simple truth for tonight. Now, let's think for a moment, what is a piano? So at its simplest, you have a keyboard, a series of metal strings, all of it in a soundboard, all of it in a resonating chamber. The keyboard acts upon the strings, which themselves are anchored into the soundboard, all of it in a protective case. Similar to how your brain is connected to your nerves, themselves anchored and rooted into your organs, all of it in a protective case. So then, your body is a piano. Now, if your body is a piano, ask yourself for a moment, what is the quality of the sound being produced? What is the caliber of the music? Am I a masterwork of melody, or am I a masterwork of mistakes? Because the strings are not in tune. So enter chiropractic, the best piano tuner you can give your body. The aim of chiropractic is to ensure that the nerves, the strings in your body, are in their proper positioning so that the information they carry, the mental impulses from your brain to the rest of your body, resonates at the proper frequency. When these strings are out of tune in the body, chiropractic calls this a vertebral subluxation. The integrity of the nerve is compromised. The body must then compensate. Unfortunately, this means your body must thrive in the context of that disruption, wasting valuable energy maintaining a faulty system. One minute in your life, one performance where you cannot achieve your best. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, one subluxation, so what? I feel fine. Why should I care? To which I reply to you, it only takes one note. One note so horrendously out of tune that it destroys the entire performance. That performance is dominated by the mistake in the middle. Is this the kind of life you want to live? A life so limited by something so simple. You add more and more subluxations into the system, further compounding the issue, further adding to the discord, until eventually the music is non-recognizable. The body can't cope. <laughs> is this the life that you want to live for yourself? Innate intelligence has written for your body a concerto beyond compare. So I implore you, my friends, my future colleagues, let your music ring out in glorious song and in harmony. Don't live your life so restricted by something so simple as a string out of place, because nobody wants to play an out-of-tune piano. Thank you very much. Well done. Well done.